Chapter Six of Joan Thursday by Louis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Jones was an awakening of another order. Like the thoroughly healthy animal she was, the moment her eyes opened, she was vividly and keenly alive, completely acquainted with her situation, in full command of every faculty with no means of determining the time save by instinct she was none the less sure that the hour wasn't late not late at all events for people who didn't have to be behind counters by half-past eight so she lay still for many minutes on the worn leather couch listening intently there was a great hush in the lodging-house not a footfall not a sound yet it was broad daylight a clear and sunny morning her quick eyes reviewing the room in this new light realized the substance of a dream come true she liked it all the high and dusty ceiling the immense and gloomy bookcases the disorderly writing-table the three sombre and yellowing steel engravings on the walls the bare beaten path that crossed the carpet diagonally from door to window the roomy and dilapidated chairs even the faint intangible ineradicable smell of tobacco that haunted the air even the generous cushion beneath her head against this last she cuddled her cheek luxuriously a shadowy smile softening her lips her lashes low she was enchanted by the novel atmosphere of this roomy chamber an atmosphere of studiousness and clear thinking and her thoughts focused sharply upon her memories of the early morning hours especially those involving the man who had put himself out to shelter her she was consumed with curiosity about him and all that concerned him in her inexperience she found it rather more than difficult to associate his courtesy his solicitude and generosity with his aloofness abstraction and detachment the type was new and difficult to classify was it true then that man flesh and blood man as differentiated from the romantic abstractions that swagger through the chapters of the ten-cent weekly libraries could be disinterested with woman content to serve rather than be served to give rather than take on the one side stood that one of the taxicab adventure together with john matthias arrayed against these a host composed of ben austins and mr winters and men with knees beasts of prey who stalked or lay in ambush along all the trails that webbed her social wilderness were they truly different matthias and that other one or were they merely old enemies in new masks how was one to know a noise in the basement the rattle of a kitchen range being shaken clear of ashes startled the girl to her feet in a twinkling however sharp her inquisitiveness and her desire to see and to know more of this man she entered no idea of lingering to be found there by him after bolting the door and before surrendering her tired body to the invitation of the couch she had yielded to the temptation to make a brief tour of inquiry the result had satisfied her that matthias had lied in one particular at least unquestionably this was his workroom but no less surely the man lived as well as worked in it much if not all of the time in its eastern wall john found a door opening into a small bedroom furnished with almost soldierly simplicity and there were two large closets in the southern wall of the chamber in one she found his wardrobe a staggering array of garments neatly arranged in sharp contrast to the confusion of his desk the other was a bathroom completely equipped a dazzling luxury in her eyes with its white enamel nickel plate glass and porcelain fittings she refreshed herself there after rising not without a guilty sensation of trespass returning to the larger room to complete her dressing no great matter since she had merely laid aside skirt coat and shirt-waist and loosened her corsets before lying down in a very little time then 
she was ready for the street but with her hands on the doorknob and bolt she hesitated looking back reluctant to go a thankless guest slowly she moved back to the centre table touching with diffident fingers its jumble of manuscripts typewriter paper memoranda and correspondence there were letters in plenty a rack stuffed with them others scattered like leaves hither and yon one and all superscribed with the name of john matthias esq many in the handwriting of women a few scented but very faintly joan wondered about these women and his relations with them was he greatly loved and by many it would not be strange she thought if he were her temper curiously unsettled by these reflections she stood for a long time staring and thinking then a renewed disturbance in the lower regions of the house sent her packing but not until she had left an inadequate scrawl of thanks whose poverty and crudity she felt keenly why had she never learned to write a hand of delicately angular distinction to bear comparison with the hands that had addressed those impeccably correct notes the hallway was deserted she let herself hastily out believing she had escaped detection sunlight swept the street from side to side a pitiless and withering blast already every trace of last night's shower had vanished blotted up by an atmosphere all a-quiver with the impetuous passion of those early slanting rays as if every living thing had been driven to shelter or dared not venture forth the street was quiet and empty in violent contrast the tides of life ran brawling through longacre square on one hand and eighth avenue on the other joan turned toward the latter moving listlessly enough once she had gained the grateful shadow of its easterly sidewalks a clock in the window of a delicatessen shop told her the hour was half past seven while the sight of the food unattractively displayed proved a sharper reminder of breakfast time she had no other concern in the world just then it would be hours before she could accomplish anything toward establishing her independence and what steps she was to take toward that consummation remained altogether nebulous in her understanding she had not gone far before a dairy lunch settled the question as to where she was to breakfast it was a small shabby dingy place its walls plastered with white tiling and mirrors joan's order comprised a cup of brownish yellow liquid which was not coffee and three weighty cakes known as sinkers these last might have been crude childish models in putty of the popular american hot biscuit but were larger and slightly scorched on top and bottom and when pride open revealed a composition resembling aerated clay joan anointed them generously with butter and consumed them with evident relish her powers of digestion were magnificent the price of a meal was ten cents she went away with a sense of repletion and seventy-two cents she turned northward again an empty day of arid hours confronted her perturbed and questioning imagination she was still without definite plans or notion which way to turn for shelter she knew only that everything must be settled before nightfall she dared not trust to find another john matthias she could not sleep in the streets or parks and return to east seventy-sixth street she would not she had her own exertion to rely upon and seventy-two cents the one as woefully inadequate as the other near columbus circle she bought a copy of the new york world for the sake of its help-wanted advertisements and strolled on into central park here she found some suggestion of nature rising refreshed from its overnight bath to bask in sunlight the grass was nowhere scorched and in shadowed spots still sparkled with raindrops the air was still steamy and heady with the fragrance of vegetation upon this artificial rectangular oasis a sky of robin's egg blue smiled benignly a sense of peace and friendly fortunes 
impregnated the girl's being somehow she felt serenely sure that nothing untoward could happen to her the world was all too beautiful and kindly she discovered a remote bench and there unfolded her newspaper and ran hastily through its advertising columns finding one reason or another for rejecting every opening that seemed to promise anything in the nature of such employment as she had theretofore known there were no cards from theatrical firms in need of chorus girls and nothing else interested her she was now obsessed by two fixed ideas as they might have been the poles of her world she was going on the stage she was not going back behind a counter yet she must find a way to live until the stage should open its jealous doors to her the morning hours ebbed slowly with increasing heat from time to time joan for one reason or another would drift idly on to another bench once as she sat dreaming with vacant eyes she was roused by the quick beating of muffled hoofs and looked up in time to see a woman on horseback pass swiftly along a bridle path closely pursued by a man likewise mounted the face of the horsewoman burned bright with pleasure and excitement and her eyes shone like stars as she glanced over her shoulder at her distant escort she rode well and looked very trim and well turned out in her habit of light-coloured linen joan thought her charming and unspeakably blessed later they returned but now their horses walked sedately side by side and the woman was smiling softly with her eyes downcast as she listened to her companion who bent eagerly close to her and spoke in a low and intimate voice for hours afterwards joan was haunted by the memory and rent with envious longing a hundred times she pictured herself in the place of the horsewoman and the man at her side wore always the manner and the aspect of john matthias about two o'clock in the afternoon she lunched meagerly on crackers and milk at another dairy establishment on columbus avenue reducing her capital to sixty-one cents then recrossing the park she made her way back through the sweltering side streets toward her late home she arrived in time to see her father's burly figure lumbering heavily up the street his gaze was to the sidewalk his mind upon the pool rooms his thick pendulous lower lip quivered with incessant inaudible repetition of race-track names and records he would not have recognized joan had he looked directly at her and he didn't look she was safe now to make her final visit to the flat thursby could be counted on not to return before six o'clock she hastened across the street and up the narrow dark and noisome stairway seated at the dining-table over an array of dishes discoloured with the residue of the midday stew her mother seemingly more immaterial than ever merely lifted shadowed and apathetic eyes to joan's face as she entered edna on the contrary jumped up with a hushed cry of surprise not untouched by alarm joan the girl assumed a confident swagger it was borne in upon her very suddenly that she must prove a ready liar in answer to the storm of questions that was about to break hello people she cried cheerfully how's everything didn't the old man meet you on the stairs demanded edna in a frightened breath nope i waited till he turned the corner joan returned defiantly anyway i ain't afraid of him what did he say last night after i was gone edna started to speak stammered and fell still turning a timid gaze to her mother no more'n he said before you went out said the latter listlessly he won't hear of your coming back a lot i care joan retorted with a fling of her head all i'm after is my things i've done enough for this family now i'm going to look out for number one the mother made no response she seemed no longer to see joan whose bosom swelled and palpitated with a suddenly acquired sense of personal grievance i've done enough she repeated mutinously edna said in a tremulous voice i don't know what we'll do without you do as i done joan broke in hotly go out and get a job and slave 
all day long so's your father won't have to support his family go on and try it i'm sick and tired of it she turned and strode angrily into the front rooms edna followed awed but inquisitive pulling their bed out from the wall joan disentangled from the accumulation of odds and ends beneath it a small suitcase of matting in which she began to pack her scanty store of belongings all in embittered silence ignoring her sister where'd you stay last night edna ventured at length with a friend of mine joan answered brusquely who the other persisted joan hesitated not one instant the lie was required to save her face maisie dean if you got to know who's maisie dean i never heard you speak of her lizzie fogarty then said joan roughly she used to work with me at the stocking counter then she went on the stage now she's making big money is she going to get you a job of course foolish where she live down in forty-fifth street near eighth avenue what's the number of the house what do you want to know for ain't you going back there joan shut down the lid of the suitcase and began to strap it yes she said with a trace of reluctance i might want to write you insisted edna anything might happen and you not know oh well then joan admitted with an air of extreme ennui the number's two eighty nine catch that don't forget i won't besides joan added lifting her voice for the benefit of the listener in the dining-room you don't need to be so much in a rush to think i ain't ever coming back to see you you got no right to think that of me after the way i've turned in my pay week in and week out right straight along i don't know what makes you think i've turned mean i'm going to come and see you and ma every week and as soon as i begin to make money you'll get your share all right all right joe the younger girl whispered drawing nearer what they had an awful row last night ma and pa after you went i bet he done all the rowin he edna's thin pale cheeks colored faintly with indignation he said rotten things to her said it was because you took after her made you want to go on the stage that's like him the brute joan commented between her teeth what did she say nothing then he lit into butch but butch stood up to him and told him to shut his face or he'd knock his block off and he did shut his face didn't he edna nodded vigorously yeah but he rowed with ma for hours after they'd went to bed i could hear him fussing and swearing she never answered one word reminiscences of like experiences of her own long white nights through which she had lain sleepless listening to the endless indistinguishable monologue of recrimination and abuse in the adjoining bedroom softened joan's mood she returned to the dining-room her mother's head had fallen forward on arms folded amidst the odious disorder of unclean dishes through a long minute joan regarded with sombre eyes that unlovely and pitiful head with its scant covering of grayish hair stretched taut from nape to temple and brow and twisted into a ragged knot at the back with its hollowed temples and sunken cheeks its thin and stringy neck emerging from the collar of a cheap and soiled mother hubbard with new intentness as if seeing them for the first time she studied the dejected curve of those toil-bent shoulders and the lean red forearms with their gnarled and scalded dull emotions troubled the girl pity and apprehension entering into her mood to war with selfishness and obstinacy this drudge that was her mother had once been a woman like herself straight and strong and fashioned in clean firm contours of wholesome flesh to what was due this dreadful metamorphosis to the stage or to man or to both must she in the end become as her mother was a battered derelict of womanhood hopeless of salvage slipping to her knees she passed an arm across the thin sharp shoulders of the woman ma she said gently 
the response was a whisper barely audible her name breathed in a sigh joan beneath her warm strong arm there was the faintest perceptible movement of the shoulders listen to me ma i ain't going to forget you and edna i am going to work hard and take care of you the mother moved her head slightly turning her head away from her daughter otherwise she was wholly unresponsive joan might have been talking to the deaf she divined suddenly something of the tragedy and despair of this inarticulate creature whose body had borne her who had once been as her daughter was now before her mental vision unfolded a vast and sordid tapestry a patchwork thing made up of hints innuendos and snatches of half-remembered conversations heretofore meaningless of a thousand and one insignificant circumstances individually valueless assembling into an almost intelligible whole picturing in dim distorted perspective the history of her mother drab pitiful appalling abruptly bending forward joan touched her lips to the sallow cheek good-bye she said stiffly i got to go she rose her mother did not move edna stared wonderingly as though a bystander at a scene of whose meaning she was ignorant joan took up her suitcase and went to the door so long kid she saluted her sister lightly take good care of ma while i'm away see you before long she hesitated again in the open doorway with her hand on the knob and tell butch i said thanks she was halfway down to the next landing before she became aware of edna bending over the banisters joan what the girl paused i most forgot butch said if he was to come in to tell you to drop round to the store this afternoon said he had something to tell you what demanded joan incredulous i don't know he just said that this morning all right good-bye good-bye joan to eyes dazzled by ambition the newsstand shouldered on either side by a prosperous delicatessen shop and a more prosperous and ornate corner saloon wore a look unusually hopeless and pitiful it was so small so narrow-chested so shabby in its plate-glass show-window dim with the accumulated grime of years bore in block letters of white enamel with several letters missing the legend a thur b news de lur and stationer igars and conchonary before the door stood a wooden newspaper stand painted red and black advertising the one cent evening sheet which furnished it gratis a few dusty stacks of papers ornamented it the door was wide open disclosing an interior furnished with dirt smeared showcases which housed a stock of cheap cigars and tobacco boxes of villainous candy to be retailed by the sensworth writing paper in gaudy fly-specked packages magazines and a handful of brittle toys perennially unsold the floor was seldom swept and had never been scrubbed in all the nine years that thursby had been a tenant of the place the establishment was as joan had anticipated in sole charge of butch who occupied a tilted chair his lean nose exploring the sporting pages of the evening journal inevitably a half-consumed sweet caporal cigarette ornamented his cynic mouth he greeted joan with a flicker of amusement lo kid he said and threw aside the paper what's doing edna said you wanted to see me yeah that's right butch yawned liberally and thrust his hat to the back of his head well said the girl sharply what do you want butch delayed his answer until he had inserted a fresh cigarette between his lips lighted it from the old and inhaled deeply interim he looked her over openly with the eyes of one from whom humanity has no secrets did you land that job he inquired at length smoke trickling from his mouth and nostrils a grim smile lurking about his lips haven't tried yet but you're going to of course what line chorus girl or a soup in the legit i'm going to try to do anything that turns up 
joan affirmed courageously try anything once eh murmured the boy with profound irony well where are you going to hang out till you land the lie ran glibly off her tongue this time with Maisie dean two eighty nine west forty fifth that where you stayed last night yes she faltered already beginning to repent and foresee unhappy complications in event butch should try to find her at the address she had given the boy got up suddenly and stood close to her searching her face with his prematurely knowing eyes look here kid he said roughly hand it to me straight now on the level there ain't no man mixed up in this she was able to meet his gaze without a tremor on the dead level butch that's all right then only only what they'll there'll be regular trouble for the guy if i ever find out you've lied to me what business i cut that snarled butch you're my sister see and you're a damn little fool and somebody's got to look out for you and that means me you go ahead and try the stage thing all you like but duck the men duck em every time he eyed her momentarily from a vast and aloof coin of vantage she was dumb with resentment oppressed by amazement and a little in awe of the boy her junior though he was now listen got any money no yes fifty cents she stammered that ain't gonna carry you far over the bumps who's gonna put up for you while you're looking for this job thing your friend Maisie? i don't know i guess so yes i'm going to stay with her well you won't last long if you don't come through with some coin every little while without warning butch produced a small packet of bills from his trouser pocket did you ever see them before he inquired with his mocking smile joan gasped my money uh-huh butch nodded fell out of your bag when you sidestepped the old man and beat it last night he didn't see it and i sneaked the bunch while he wasn't looking Gwine, take it he thrust the money into her fingers that closed convulsively upon it for a moment she choked and gulped on the verge of tears so overpowering was the sense of relief oh butch ah cut that out it's your money all right ain't it she began with trembling fingers to count the bills butch tilted his head to one side and regarded her with undisguised disgust say you must have a swell opinion of me kid to think i'd hold out on you she stared bewildered there's twenty-two dollars here butch her hand moved out as if offering to return the money with an angry movement he slapped it back and turned away that's right he muttered sourly i slipped an extra ten in i guess i got a right to ain't i you're my sister and you'll need it before you get through all right she lingered stunned but butch i oughtn't to i can that guff and beat it the old man's liable to be back any minute seizing her suitcase he urged her none too gently toward the door. It's awful good of you, Butch. Awful good. All right, all right. But can the gush thing till next time. Overwhelmed, Joan permitted herself to be thrust out of the door, and then, recovering to some extent, masked her excitement as best she could and trudged away across town, back toward Central Park. Blind instinct urged her to that refuge where she would have quiet and peace while she thought things out a necessity which had not existed until within the last fifteen minutes before her interview with butch she had been penniless and planless but now she found herself in circumstances of comparative affluence and independence twenty-two dollars strictly economized surely ought to keep her fed and sheltered in decent lodgings for at least three weeks within which time she would quite as surely find employment of some sort it remained to decide how best to conserve her resources on the face of the situation she had nothing to do but seek the cheapest and meanest rooming-house in the city but in her heart of hearts she had already determined to return to the establishment of madame duprat beyond her means though it might be 
ostensibly to await the return of the dancing deans secretly that she might be under the same roof with john matthias and in the end it was to number two eighty nine that she turned at half past four she stood again on the brown stone stoop waiting an answer to her ring and at the same moment john matthias handsomely garbed in the best of his wardrobe but otherwise invested in a temper both indignant and rebellious instituted a dash from room to train handicapped by a time limit ridiculously brief as the front door slammed at his back he pulled up smartly to escape collision with the girl on the stoop he looked at and through her barely conscious of her pretty pallid face and the light of recognition in her eyes then with a murmured apology he dodged neatly round her swung down the steps and frantically hailed a passing taxicab joan dashed and disappointed saw the vehicle swing in to the curb and heard matthias as he clambered in direct the driver to the pennsylvania station with all possible haste she stared after the dwindling cab disconsolately he hadn't even known her in another minute she would have turned her back on the house and sought lodgings elsewhere but the door abruptly opened a second time revealing madame de prat a forbidding but imperative figure upon the threshold timidly in her confusion the girl made some semi-articulate inquiry as to the address of miss maisie dean to her astonishment and consternation the landlady unbent and smiled ah she exclaimed with unction mademoiselle is the friend of monsieur matthias is it not very good will you not be pleased to enter it is but this afternoon that the sisters dean have returned so altogether unexpectedly End of chapter six chapter seven of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard alone in the body of a touring car helena tankerville a slender and fair woman in white as cool and fresh to look upon as the day was hot and weary to endure consulted her bracelet watch shrugged recklessly and lifted her parasol an inch or so to enable her to level an imperious stare at the point where the straight shining lines of railroad track debouched from the western woodland as if expecting the very strength of her impatience to conjure into sight the overdue train she was very pretty and prettily dressed and sure of herself there were evidences of temper and determination mixed with disquietude in her manner and there was no one in her present neighbourhood except possibly her chauffeur of whose existence she considered it worth her while to be aware none the less she was conscious that she was visible a faint puff of vapour bellied above the distant screen of pines immediately a far mellow prolonged hoot turned all faces toward the west a rakish low-lying locomotive with a long tail of coaches emerged from the woodland and breathing forth vast volumes of smoke fled a pursuing cloud of dust straight as an arrow to the station where panting with triumph and relief as one having won a race it drew in beside the platform incontinently upwards of two hundred people the majority of them men in apparently comfortable circumstances well dressed to the standards of summer negligence swarmed out of the cars and ran hither and yon heedlessly elbowing one another and gabbling vociferously as they sought accommodations in the long rank of station wagons buses surreys smartly appointed traps and motor cars helena bending forward overlooked them all with imperceptible disdain the face she sought was not among those that swam in review beneath her and presently encountering an overbold glance she drew back with a little frown of annoyance already the throng was thinning conveyances laden to the guards were drawing out of the rank and rattling and rumbling off through stifling drifts of dust 
no more passengers were issuing from the coaches and already the parlor car porters were picking up their stools and preparing to swing back aboard the train the conductor waved his final signal the bell tolled its warning the locomotive belched black smoke and cinders and amid stentorian puffings began to move the coaches following to their tune of clanking couplings no sign of her refractory nephew and still helena hesitated to give the order to drive home john had telephoned it wasn't like him to be delinquent in his promises the end of the last car was passing her when she saw him he appeared suddenly on the rearmost platform with a startled expression and air of a jack-in-the-box dropped his suitcase over the rear rail ran down the steps delayed an instant to gauge distance and speed and with nice calculation dropped lightly to the ground pausing only to recover his luggage he approached the motor-car with a sheepish smile for his handsome young aunt who regarded him with an air of mingled bewilderment and despair well she exclaimed as soon as he was near enough to hear of all things right you are he affirmed gravely tossing his handbag into the car and following it kick along davy he added with a nod to the chauffeur and gracefully sank back upon the seat beside helena purring the car began to grope its way through the dust fog matthias turned twinkling eyes to his aunt she compressed her lips and shook her head helplessly words inadequate auntie quite she said what were you doing on that train to come so near forgetting the station thinking he explained wrapped in profound and exhaustive meditation i say how stunning you look she gave him up or one inferred as much from her gesture you're impossible she said in a tragic voice thinking well i had to wait there and be ogled by all those odious men you must have been ready to sink through the ground she eyed him stonily you didn't care even if i hadn't been preoccupied it would never have entered my head that you seriously objected to being admired she received this in injured silence matthias chuckled to himself and settled more comfortably into his seat the motor-car turned off the main road from the station to the village of port madison down which the greater number of its predecessors had clattered and found unclouded air on a well-metalled lane bordered with aged oaks and maples through a funnel-like dip between hills matthias looking past his aunt caught a fleeting glimpse of the cluttered roofs of port madison its shallow land-locked harbour set with a little fleet of pleasure-boats and the ineffable burning blue of the distant sound i presume helena returned to the charge disarmingly aggrieved you think i ought to be grateful for your condescending to return at all forgive me he pleaded not altogether insincerely i know it wasn't right of me to run away like that but i couldn't help it you couldn't help it she murmured despairingly that's just the way of it i got to thinking about a play i wanted to write yesterday afternoon and well along about ten o'clock it got too strong for me i just had to get back to my typewriter you know how that is i what do i know about your silly playwriting laughing he bent nearer and patted the gloved hand on the cushions beside him you know perfectly well helena dear what it is to want to do something so bad you simply can't help yourself it's the matthias blood in both of us that's why you ran off and married tankerville against everybody's advice of course it did turn out beautifully but you didn't stop to wonder whether it would or not when you took it into your head to marry him the same with me you decide that it's high time for your delightful sister-in-law to get married and you look round and fix on your dutiful nephew for the bridegroom-elect only because you wanted to be that way don't you she demanded sharply he took a moment to think this over i suppose i do he admitted almost reluctantly but you're in love with her helena declared with spirit quite true but then why 
she begged in tones of moderate exasperation why do you object hang fire run away like a silly frightened schoolboy as soon as i get everything arranged for you but you see i'm not in a position to get married yet he argued i haven't how's that not in a position she interrupted testily you keep forgetting i'm the family pauper the poor relation whereas venetia has all the money there is more or less there you are helena turned her palms out expressively folded them in resignation what more can you ask something more nearly approaching an equal footing at least jack she turned to him with a fine air of innocence how much money have you got anyway thirty-six hundred per annum as you know very well he replied but my dear dear auntie you're one of the most beautiful creatures alive and i'm awfully proud and fond of you surely you must understand that no decent fellow wants to go to the girl he's in love with and make a proposition like this i've got thirty-six hundred and you've got three hundred and sixty thousand let's marry and divide how long have you been writing plays oh several years and how many have you written quite a few and how much have you made at it next to nothing but then why do you persist because it's the thing i want to do but you can't make any money at it i may make a lot before long meanwhile i like it but if you'd only listen to reason and let tankerville with all the best intentions in the world dear helena tankerville couldn't make me a successful business man it isn't in me permit me to muddle along in my own special wrong-headed way and the chances are i'll make good in the end but once and for all i refuse positively to give up my trade and try to make sense of wall street methods helena moved her shoulders impatiently for an instant she was silenced then but marriage needn't necessarily put an end to your playwriting a good marriage as with venetia ought even to help i should think but you persist in forgetting i'm not a fortune hunter but she countered smartly marbridge is he said oh marbridge as if dumbfounded she smiled quietly a very wise and superior smile to this point the car had been steadily ascending the noise of the motor together with the frequent stutterings of the exhaust with the muffler cutout had been sufficient to disguise the substance of their communication from the ears of the operator now however they surmounted the highest point and began the more gradual descent to the tankerville estate and with less noise there was consequently very little talking on part of the two on the rear seat for which matthias was an altogether sorry he wanted time to think to think about venetia tankerville and the new light cast upon her by his aunt's concluding remark as affected by her friendship with vincent marbridge in the natural swing of events it would never have occurred to him to consider marbridge's attention seriously nobody ever took marbridge seriously he believed aside from a few exceptionally foolish women noiselessly the car slipped down a mile-long avenue to the brow of a promontory on either hand tanglewood's long parked terraces fell away to the water on the left the harbor of port madison on the right long island sound matthias was barely conscious of these things his mood was haunted by an extraordinarily clear vision of vincent marbridge not tall but by no means short a trifle stout but none the less a well-knit figure of a man and tremendously alive dark with a broad blunt good-humoured face and seal-brown eyes that were exceedingly handsome and expressive keen-witted and accomplished knowing almost everybody in every place and thing worth knowing hedonist and egoist selfish unscrupulous magnetic fascinating impressed matthias frowned his aunt eyed him covertly with a sly semi-affectionate semi-malicious smile shadowing her mouth slackening its pace the car took the wide semicircle of the drive and slid sedately to a dead stop by the carriage block matthias pulled himself together jumped out and gave his hand to his aunt 
they turned toward the house tankerville's pretentious marble palace crowned the brow of the headland with an effect as exquisite as a dream of an ancient french chateau realized in snow for this its owner had his wife to thank helena unable to curb her husband's desire for the most expensive and ostentatious place obtainable had at least guided his choice of design it was too magnificent it was overpowering but it was beautiful and it was more than ever beautiful at this hour with its walls in part bathed in a rose-pink light of sunset in part shadowed as with a wash of violet and with all its admirable proportions stark against the dusky sapphire of the sound an unwonted stillness clung about the place matthias wondered it might be the palace of the sleeping beauty he said why this deadly and benumbing silence what oh simply that tankerville decided this morning to take everybody down to huntington for lunch they got away quite early in the enchantress come out on the terrace we'll look for them they passed through a wide cool panelled hallway why didn't you go you know i hate the water besides i had a headache at least i had one until the enchantress got under way and furthermore i meant to stay at home and meet you and talk it out venetia went of course of course and marbridge and everybody he grunted thoughtfully they descended to a terrace which jutted airily out over the edge of a cliff with a sheer drop of a hundred and fifty feet to the beach helena dropping languidly into a wicker chair motioned matthias to the broad marble balustrade any sign of the enchantress o oh, perturbed nephew he lingered there for an instant marvelling with an inexhaustible wonder at the magnificent sweep of the view then remembering raked the waters until he discovered tankerville's power cruiser standing in toward the dock from the bottleneck mouth of port madison harbour returning he reported seated himself near his aunt lighted a cigarette why did you ask him here anyway he demanded abruptly who she parried mischievously marbridge of course he admitted sulking in the face of her manifest amusement jealous jackie oh if you insist she laughed the most encouraging symptom you've yet betrayed i didn't ask him tankerville did he likes him the man's amusing after all but you like him he amuses me he's not precisely a tame cat dear boy she laughed again i didn't fetch you out here to worry about me i'm fireproof venetia's quite another pair of shoes fret about her as much as you like when does he go marbridge i mean monday i think at least i believe tankerville asked him for a week only and that's why you asked me this particular week i thought you'd be a good counter irritant and hoped you'd come to your senses and secure venetia against all marbridges for all time to come you gave me to understand you would pardon he corrected a trifle stiffly i admitted to you in strict confidence that i was in love with venetia i never promised to ask her to marry me well that's what i understood you to me and anyway you'd better neither tankerville nor i can control the girl she's her own mistress and headstrong enough to be a good match for any matthias that ever lived if marbridge ever convinces her that she likes him she concluded with an eloquent ellipsis probably mused matthias after prolonged deliberation i'd have lost my head before this if it hadn't been so full of that play helena smiled indulgently it's not too late i hope troubled he rose walked to the balustrade jerked his cigarette into space and returned as between one fortune hunter and another he said gloomily i'm conceited enough to think myself the safer bet his aunt smiled more openly see what venetia thinks i will said matthias with a fine air of inalterable determination End of chapter 7
of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard since it was her whim and the winds indulged helena had ordered that the rite of the late dinner be celebrated by candlelight alone ten shaded candles graced the places in the centre of the table an ancient candelabrum of gold added the mellow illumination of its seven alabaster arms whose small flames yearned upward ardently with scarce a perceptible flicker though every window was wide to the whispering night one of these that faced matthias framed a shivering sky of stars and the still black shield of the sound on which the fixed and undeviating glare of a remote lighthouse was reflected darkly a long unwavering way of light he thought of a tall wax candle burning amid the sanctified shadows of some vast and dark and still cathedral they were ten at table from helena's right pat atherton tankerville's partner a mrs magendy marbridge a mrs cardrow tankerville at the head on his right mrs pat atherton matthias venetia tankerville Agenda. the latter and his wife were almost strangers to matthias having arrived only the previous afternoon but he thought them as pleasant and handsome people as any of those with whom the tankervilles liked to fill their house the athertons were old friends he had known them well long before helena dreamed of marrying tankerville marbridge was an indifferently familiar figure in the ways of his life they frequented the same clubs and of late he had begun to encounter the older man more and more frequently in his theatrical divagations remained mrs cardrow a widow the acquaintance of a week's standing cardrow had been in some way connected with the enterprises of messrs tankerville and atherton how matthias didn't remember a man of whom rumour said little that was good until it began to say de mortuis he had killed himself for no accountable reason his widow seemed to have survived bereavement with amazing grace matthias admired her greatly women he knew helena and their number mistrusted her for no cause perceptible to him he liked her thought her little less than absolutely charming so evidently did marbridge whose attitude toward her this evening was a little more noticeably attentive than ever before he seemed to exert himself to interest and divert his black eyes snapped as he talked his heavy body swayed slightly from the hips lending an accent to his animation his laugh was frequent and infectious she was a woman who smiled more than she laughed she smiled now inscrutably her beautiful insolent eyes half veiled with demure lashes her face turned to marbridge her chin a trifle high bringing out the clear strong lines of her throat and shoulders which had the texture the pallor and the firmness of fine ivory her eyes when she chose to discover them were brown her eyebrows almost black her hair dull gold the gold of the candelabrum the gold of artifice on the word of helena perhaps it was to this odd colouring ivory and brown black and gold that mrs cardrow owed most of her strange and provoking quality but there was something else something one could not define at once stimulating and elusive less charm than allure nameless that attracted and repelled these were thoughts set stirring by a dozen semi-curious glances at the women in pauses in his conversation with venetia matthias was in fact indifferent to mrs cardrow but he was tremendously interested in venetia it could hardly be otherwise since his talk with helena he was to marry venetia amazing thought she was adorable of the other women none compared with mrs cardrow even helena's beauty paled in contrast but venetia was to mrs cardrow as dawn to noon one looked at venetia and thought of a still sea at daybreak mobile to the young and fitful airs radiant with sunlight breathless with apprehension of the long golden hours to come one looked at mrs cardrow and thought of woman venetia was dark 
and the other fair venetia was by no means a child mrs cardrow not yet thirty the gulf that set them apart was not so much of years as of caste they lived and thought on different levels mental if not social matthias liked to think venetia on the higher order he was to marry her incredible and to-night her eyes were warm and kind for him and all for him he could not see that there was anything of self-interest in the infrequent glances she cast at those who sat opposite playing their time-old game with such engaging candor if she had thought much of marbridge surely she must have betrayed some little pique or chagrin she was not blind neither was she patient and prone to self-effacement matthias had known her long enough to have garnered vivid memories of her resentment of slights whether real or fancied she was unique and wonderful in many ways but he told himself in a catchphrase of the hour she was essentially human he could not have cared for a woman without temper he cared intensely for this girl-woman whose rare loveliness seemed almost exotic in its singular scheme whose skin fine in texture and colourless as milk-white satin was splashed with lips of burning scarlet whose eyes of deepest violet were luminous in the shadow of hair of the richness and lustre of burnished bronze luminous and kind to him he dared to hope greatly of their sympathy through dinner she had entertained him with a mirthful inconsecutive narrative of the adventures of the day now as ices were served her interest swerved suddenly and found a new object in himself why did you run away last night you really noticed it light malice trembled on her lips not till this morning you were so busy an imperceptible nod indicating marbridge i felt myself becoming ornamental whereas utility's my proudest attribute so i left you dancing and skipped by the light of the moon not really i assure you put out with me i mean he sought her eyes again and found them veiled and downcast not the least in the world then again why i wanted to get back to work besides i had a little business with a manager and so he had but until this moment he had forgotten it play business i'm afraid i know no other is something new to be produced matthias nodded goes into rehearsal in august a melodrama i wrote some time ago the jade god who produces it right out who's he a foolish actor played a sketch of mine in vaudeville for a couple of years and because that got over thinks this piece must but it will won't it i hope so but i'm glad it's not my money and where will you open heaven and the schuberts only know write out books through the schuberts you understand i'm afraid i don't the schuberts are the independents the opposition to the syndicate headed by claw and erlanger you see the theatres of this country are practically all controlled by one or the other combination if you want booking for your show you've got to take sides serve god or mammon and which is which the difference is imperceptible to the innocent bystander but you let us know if we open within motoring distance of town rather tankerville edging his plump little body forward on his chair manoeuvred his round and sun-scorched face in vain attempts to catch his wife's eye past the intervening candelabrum helena however divined his desire coffee in the card-room george please tankerville bleated plaintively there was a concerted movement from the table venetia lingered with matthias it's auction to-night shall you play afraid i'll have to so will you helena you know of course we must only she sighed petulant i'd rather not i'd rather talk to you heroic measures he laughed but consolation note we're two over two full tables therefore we'll have to cut in and out that'll give us some time to ourselves yes she agreed but it'll be just our luck to be disengaged at different times 
he paused in amused incredulity do you really want to talk to me as badly as all that she nodded curtaining her eyes very much she said softly they entered the card-room and were summoned to different tables matthias cut and edged mrs cardrow out by a single pip how venetia fared he did not learn more than that she was to play while marbridge was to stay out the first rubber he played even less intelligently than usual with a mind distracted venetia's new attitude pleasant as had been all their association was a development of disconcerting suddenness or else he had been witless and blind beyond relief and yet how could he say he was so frequently misled by faculties befogged with dreaming that overlooked when they did not flatly deny the obvious it was possible that helena had been more wise than he a sense of strain handicapped his judgment whether atmospheric or bred of his own emotion he could not tell and yet plumbing the deeps of his humour he discovered nothing there more exacting than bewilderment more exciting than hope on the other hand he could fix upon nothing in the bearing of these amiable people to lead him to believe that the feeling of tensity to which he was susceptible was not the creation of his own fancy they played with a certain abandon of enjoyment absorbed in their diversion looking past venetia at the other table venetia slim and tall and worshipful in a wonderful black gown that rendered dazzling the whiteness of her flesh he could see mrs cardrow and marbridge at the piano in the drawing-room the woman sat all but motionless white arms alone moving graciously in the half-light as her deft hands wandered over the keyboard marbridge his arms folded lounged over the piano his back to the card-room the eloquent movements of his round dark head its emphatic nods and argumentative waggings seemed to indicate that he was bearing the burden of their talk but the music hushed though it was covered his accents the woman was looking up into his face with an expression of quick pleased interest her lips half parted smiling it did not occur to matthias to wonder about the substance of their conversation but for a sure clue to the intrigue of venetia's heart and his own he would have given worlds throwing down his cards tankerville announced with satisfaction game rubber jack you go out praise the saints you cost mrs pat close on to fifteen dollars more shame to you sorry matthias smiled cheerfully rising you would have me play hearkening and repentance retorted tankerville next time i marry you can bet your sweet life i'm going to pick out a family of sure enough bridgers call mrs cardrow will you now like a good fellow but mrs cardrow had already left the piano matthias held a chair for her and then since the rubber at the other table was not yet decided strolled to a window the night tempted him almost unconsciously he stepped out upon the terrace and wandered to the parapet abstractedly he lighted a cigarette when the tobacco was aglow he held the match from him at arm's length over the abyss its flame burned as steadily as though protected flickering out only when released it fell no night ever more still than this land and water alike spellbound in breathless calm even on the brow of that high foreland where tankerville had builded him his lordly pleasure home no hint of movement in the air and yet matthias was conscious of nothing resembling oppression exhilaration rather he smiled vaguely into the darkness from far below echoing up from the placid waters of port madison as from a sounding-board came the tinkle-tinkle of a banjo and the complaint of a harmonica when these were silent the wailing of violins was clearly audible bridging a distance of over a mile across the harbour from the ballroom of the country club far out upon the sound the night-boat for boston trudged along like a slow-winging firefly and presently its wash swept inshore to rouse the beach below to sibilant and murmurous protest in the east the vault of night was pallid azure and silver with the promise of the reluctant moon a hand fell gently upon his arm 
Phoenicia's. He had not been aware of her approach. Yet he was not startled. He turned his head slowly, smiling. She said softly, Don't say anything. Wait till it rises. They waited in silence. Her hand lingered upon his arm. And that last, he knew, was trembling. The nearness of her person, the intimacy of her touch, weighed heavily upon his senses. An edge of golden light appeared where the skies came down to the sea, hesitated, increased. That wan and spectral light, waxing, lent emphasis to the rare and delicious wonder of her loveliness, to the impregnable mystery of her womanhood. He regarded her with something near awe, with keen perception of his unworthiness, as a spirit from heaven had stooped to commune with him. She lived, breathed. The hand upon his arm was warm and strong, incredible. The gibbous disc swung clear of the horizon, and like some strange misshapen acrobat climbed a low-lying latticework of clouds, the girl turned away to a huge willow-basket chair. Matthias found its fellow and drew near to her. He struggled to speak. He fancied that she waited for him to speak, but his mind refused to frame, his tongue to utter aught but the stalest of analogies. No do to-night, he hazarded at length, shamefaced. After an instant of silence, she laughed clearly and gently. Oh, romantic man, she said, now that you have shattered the spell, if you please, a cigarette. He supplied this need, held a match, delayed holding it when it had served its purpose, enraptured with the refulgent wonder of that cameo of sweet flesh and blood set against the melting shadows, silver and purple and blue. With a second low, light laugh, she bent forward and daintily extinguished the flame with a single puff. I don't wish to be stared at. Pardon, he said, mechanically, startled, but why? Perhaps I'm afraid you may see too much. Impossible, he declared with conviction. Odd as it may sound, she said in a mocking voice, I have my secrets. Her back was to the moon, her face a pallid oval, framed in ebony, illegible, but the moonlight was full upon his face, and she who would might read. His disadvantage was obvious. It wasn't fair. Lounging, she crossed her knees, puffed thrice, and cast the cigarette into the gulf. Abruptly she sat forward, studying him intently. He was disturbed with a singular uneasiness. Jack, said Venetia very quietly, is it true that you love me? Good Lord, he cried, sitting up. Is it true? He blinked. His head was whirling. He said nothing, sank back, quite automatically puffed with such fury that in a trice he had reduced the cigarette to an inch of glowing coal, scorched his fingers, and threw it from him. Then he gasped stupidly, Venetia, is it true? She had not moved. The question had the force of stubborn purpose through its very monotony, a monotony of inflection no less than of repetition her accents were both serious and sincere she was in earnest she meant to know but venetia or have you been just making believe all this long time it i why of course it's true he stammered lamely then why haven't you ever told me so there sounded reproach not unkindly but real he shook his wits together. How could I guess you'd care to know? Do you know me so little as to think I'd resent it, if I happened not to care? I don't know. Didn't think of it that way. In fact, you've knocked me silly. But why? Because I've been straightforward? Dear boy! She lifted a hand to him. He took it in, trembling. You're twenty-seven. I'm twenty-three. We know one another pretty well. We know ourselves, at least slightly. Why can't we face things, facts, as man and woman, not as children? What's the good of make-believe? If this thing lies between us, let's be frank about it. He hesitated, doubting, searching her face. 
her look was very sweet and kind of a sudden he cried venetia came to his knees beside her chair snatched her hand and crushed it between his own to his lips i love you i've always loved you he felt the velvet of her lips her breath upon his forehead and made as if to clasp her to him but she slipped back straightening an arm to fend him off no she whispered not now not here dear boy get up think this moonlight anybody might see i love you i know and dear i'm glad so glad but you made me ask you i couldn't help that venetia i was afraid i hardly dared to dream of this you were you are above beyond gently her hand sealed his mouth dear silly boy get up if you won't i must releasing her hand he rose his emotion shook him violently at discretion he dropped back into his chair he looked about him a little wildly his glance embracing all the weird fantasy of the night the cold inaccessible glittering vault of stars the malformed and sardonic moon the silken bosom of the sound the lace and purple velvet draperies of the land down on the harbor the banjo and harmonica were ragging to tatters a sentimental ballad of the day from the house came a burst of laughter tankerville exultant in some successful stratagem at cards his gaze returned to venetia she sat without moving wrapped in the exquisite mystery of her enigmatic heart bewitching bewildering steadfastly reading him with eyes veiled and inscrutable in liquid shadow muttering preposterous he dropped his head between his hands i'm mad mad he groaned without stirring she demanded why he shook his head free to have owned up let this come to pass i love you but that's all i dare say to you isn't it maybe enough for me i mean i'm mad to marry you but how can i ask you to have me what have i to offer you the position of wife to a poverty-stricken half-grown playwright it's out of reason but possibly am i not the one to judge of that no i won't have you marry a man unable to provide for you in the way to which you've been educated it's a point of honour but i have you must understand i've got to be able able to humour your every whim with things that way what of your own you choose to spend on yourself won't count the issue is my ability to give you everything but that will come when i can't promise i hardly dare hope this new play isn't your only hope no success or failure you'll keep on certainly then it's only a question of time but you how can i ask you to wait there's no necessity but it must be he rose unable to remain still give me six months i've got another piece of work under way and others only waiting their turn in six months i can no the monosyllable brought him up sharply he stared her white arms radiant in that clear unearthly light lifted toward him if you want me dear she said in a voice tense with emotion it must be now soon to wait six months i that's him the beautiful modulations of helena tankerville's voice interrupted standing in one of the windows to the card-room she said simply an exquisite night then coming out upon the terrace and seeing venetia and matthias she moved toward them oh there you are jack you're wanted indoors matthias unable quickly to regain his poise said nothing venetia answered for him calmly he can't come what dear i say he can't come helena he's engaged engaged recovering helena bore down upon them with a little call of delight 
not really oh my dears i'm so glad she gathered venetia into her arms End of chapter eight chapter nine of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. unremarked by any of these marbridge stepped out upon the terrace he was light of foot like most men of his type his voice unctuous with the southern drawl which he affected together with quaint southern twists of speech was the first warning they had of his approach this is surely one powerful fine night i don't wonder you all like it better out here than he checked suddenly in both words and action the women had started apart why he added slowly as though perplexed i hope i don't intrude his quick dark eyes shifted rapidly from helena to venetia to matthias and again back to the women during a momentary lull of embarrassment then helena said quietly not in the least but this makes you the first to learn the news mr marbridge venetia and my nephew are engaged to be married engaged the man's chin slapped his eyes widened a cigarette fell unheeded from his fingers he smiled a trace stupidly why he recollected himself almost instantaneously there certainly is some surprise but i do congratulate you both with a stride he seized the hand venetia could not refuse him and pressed it warmly you're the luckiest man i ever knew he declared turning to clasp hands with matthias instinctively the latter met his powerful grasp with one as forceful thank you he said smiling gravely into the other's eyes under his firm but pleasant regard they wavered and fell then steadied with a glint of temper their hands fell apart marbridge stepped back perhaps i don't know you well enough mr matthias to congratulate miss tankerville as heartily as i do you but i'm persuaded she's not liable to make any serious mistake matthias nodded thoughtfully i understand your intentions are excellent i'm sure we both thank you venetia mr marbridge is very amiable said the girl a hint of mirth modifying her composure but i'm afraid helena she added quickly if you don't mind i think i'll go to my room to marbridge she gave a quaint little bow that was half an old-fashioned courtesy robbed of formality by her spirited smile to matthias her hand and a gentle good-night taking the arm of her sister-in-law she drew her toward the house watching them until they disappeared marbridge chuckled quietly took my breath away he declared why i never suspected for an instant he dropped heavily but with characteristic grace into a chair it takes you quiet boys to get away with the girls like venetia all fire and dash yes said matthias reflectively it does doesn't it have another cigarette he offered his case you dropped yours thanks she's a thoroughbred all right i reckon if i wasn't a mite too middle-aged maybe i might have set you a pace that you'd have found lively going well let's be thankful nothing of that sort happened at all events marbridge looked up over his match and lifted his brows but if in reality a retort trembled on his lips he thought better of it and before either spoke again tankerville was on the terrace brandishing pudgy arms hey you he said fretfully don't you know you're holding us all up come on in but the game held less attraction for matthias than ever and after another and final failure to establish him in tankerville's good graces he pocketed his losses relinquished his place to marbridge and with even less inclination for bed than for cards took himself again out into the open night 
but now the terrace was all too small to contain his spirits the need of action movement freedom space was strong upon him striding away down the drive that wound like a broad band of whitewash through its dark bordering lawns and darker coppices he found even the grounds of tanglewood too constricted for the extravagant energy that animated him and took to the broad highways with all long island free to his tireless spirit for several hours or more he trudged valiantly hither and yon with little or no notion of whither he went with his head in the stars and his feet in the dust and kicking up a famous smother of it and in that time was wittingly as near to happiness as he had ever been in all his days the faculty of coherent thought had passed from him utterly but it passed unmourned venetia was his this thought alone sufficed him he had neither time nor inclination to entertain those doubts those questionings and apprehensions which had beset him in saner humour theretofore it mattered nothing now that he was poor and she wealthy nothing that all his efforts to make something of himself had thus far proved vain and fruitless she loved him it was enough he came to his senses eventually long enough to recognize anew the grounds of tanglewood of a sudden his impetuosity had run out remained the pleasant languor of a healthy body thoroughly exercised the peace of a mind vexed by no insatiable desire and still he was not sleepy purposefully he retarded his footsteps approaching the house with stealth eager to escape observation and gain his room unhindered to-morrow would be soon enough to submit to the ordeal of congratulations it was with a shock of amazement that he saw the house all quiet and dark he pulled out his watch and studied its face by moonlight finding its evidence difficult to credit twenty minutes past one in the morning gingerly keeping to the grass in order that the gravel of the drive might not by its crunching underfoot betray him or alarm some wakeful member of the household he approached the front door wondering if he were locked out and not without amusement at his self-contrived predicament what to do if he were to his relief one half of the double door stood a foot or two ajar thanks he had no doubt to the thoughtfulness of helena or tankerville blessing both on general principles he entered shut the door and softly shot the bolt turned in deep obscurity to grope his way to the foot of the stairs but paused with a hand on the newel post and his breath catching in his throat in the hallway above a night light was burning dim and low but sufficiently diffused to show him the figure of a woman silently descending the stairway when he first became aware of her she was indeed almost within arm's length a shape of shadow scarce three shades lighter than the encompassing gloom venetia possibly having waited and watched for him from her windows overlooking the drive stealing down to bid him that good night they had perforce foregone in the presence of helena and marbridge that wild and extravagant surmise had no more than entered his mind when he found the woman in his arms he gave herself into them with a gesture of abandonment with a little sigh that escaped in broken measure murmurous and fond an arm that lifting flashed naked to the shoulder as the sleeve of her negligee fell back encircled his neck and drew down his head to hers and her mouth fastened to his with clinging lips half stunned by receipt of that mad caress one thought shot like light through the turmoil of his senses this was never venetia with an effort he straightened his neck against the pressure of the woman's arm she strove to overcome his resistance wooing him in accents hushed and shaking with passion vincent sweetheart he interrupted hastily i beg pardon the inadequacy of that stilted form disgusting him he added i am john matthias immediately the woman released him and with a gasp sank back against the newel post her breath came gustily with a sound like smothered sobbing pitifully he divined her shame and terror and though he knew her very well beyond mistake 
he said evenly don't worry there isn't any light in a stupefied voice she iterated no light it's so confounded dark he complained i couldn't tell you from eve so perhaps you'd better run back to your room now he turned away deliberately behind him after a pause of an instant there rose a sound of soft rustling draperies a swift and hushed patter of footsteps on the stairs a moment or two later a latch clicked very gently in the corridor above quietly matthias switched on a single light returned to the door unbolted and quickly opened it he was not disappointed that this manoeuvre surprised a shadow skulking in the penumbra of rose bushes that bordered the steps the shadow of a man who drew back swiftly when he recognized matthias this last stepped out turned in the direction of the fugitive shadow and pursuing at leisure hailed in a quiet and natural tone i say marbridge that you immediately he came upon marbridge at a standstill round the corner of the house awaiting him in a curious posture of antagonism his feet well apart heavy body inclined a trifle forward round dark head low between his shoulders hands clenched upon his face a cloud of anger matthias greeted him suavely i was afraid i'd locked you out ignoring his attitude even as he seemed to ignore the fact that marbridge had changed from evening dress to a suit of dark flannels he added coming in now it's a bit late marbridge pulled himself together perhaps you're right he assented surlily but it was with patent effort that he mastered his resentment and accompanied matthias back to the doors a fine night what matthias filled in the awkward silence yes agreed marbridge brusquely too fine he admitted too fine to waste in bed sleepless eh yes following him in matthias refastened the door several of us seem troubled with the same indisposition he observed coolly swinging to face marbridge that's why i bothered to call you in you know marbridge scowled perhaps i don't get you she has gone back to bed matthias explained pleasantly i didn't like to think of you waiting out there all alone marbridge choked on a retort turned and began slowly to mount the stairs oh going half a minute the man paused and in silence looked down i just happened to think perhaps you haven't a timetable in your room said matthias amiably there are several early trains to-morrow you know i fancy the eight seven would suit you as well as any he got no answer other than a grunt marbridge resumed his deliberate ascent gained the upper floor and disappeared good night matthias called after him softly and turned out the light End of chapter 9chapter ten of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard monday morning found mr matthias back at his desk and in a tolerably unhappy temper tormented not only by that conscience-stricken sensation of secret guilt inseparable from a return to neglected work but also by a less reasonable in fact inexplicable to him feeling of discomfort as though he were a trespasser upon the premises rather than their lawful tenant never before had he felt less at home never more ill at ease in the homely solitude of his workshop and lodgings as for his work he found page six of that promising young first act in the typewriter carriage precisely as it had been left on his receipt of helena's peremptory telegram removing the sheet he turned back to the first page and read what had been written with such high and eager hope and looked his dashed bewilderment knitting portentous brows sedulously he reconsidered the manuscript at length then with a groan put it aside ran fingers through his hair till it rose rampant and sat scowling darkly at the wall groping blindly and vainly for the lost ends of that snapped thread of enthusiasm 
the first flush of confidence vanished what he had written owned heart-rending incoherence in his understanding however he assured himself it would come back to him in time indeed it was bound to it wasn't the first time this sort of thing had happened to him nor yet the second he was no raw novice to cry despair over such an everyday setback but what the devil was the matter with him all the way to town he had been full of his theme as keen set for work as a schoolboy for a holiday and hardly less for the well-worn comforts of his abode and lo here sat he with his head as empty as his hands and at misfit feeling battering him to exasperation instinctively he consulted a pipe and through its atmosphere the view from his windows the never-failing tried and true and heartening monotony of that sun-scorched area of backyards grim and unlovely in the happiest weather cat-haunted and melancholy in all its phases but to-day he essayed vainly to distil from contemplation of it any of the rare glamour of yesterday's zeal and faith it was all gone all and the erratic mind of him would persist in trailing off after errant thoughts of venetia tankerville surpassing inconsistency of the human heart three hours ago in her company he had been able to control and to behave himself to anticipate with pleasure the prospect of returning to his desk after escorting her from the pennsylvania to the grand central station and putting her aboard the train for greenwich whither she was bound for a fortnight's visit but now he could think of nothing but venetia venetia's eyes her scarlet lips her exquisite hands her hair of bronze her moods and whims her laughter and her pensiveness alike adorable venetia in evening dress on the moon-drenched terrace of tanglewood venetia on the tennis courts all in white glorified by sunlight an amazingly spirited victorious figure venetia with her hair blown across her eyes at the wheel of one of tankerville's racing motor craft venetia in the gloom of the grand central station lingering to say good-bye to her betrothed it required several days for this stupid gentleman to awaken to the fact that the name of his trouble was merely love that an acknowledged lover is a person vastly different from a diffident and distant worshipper that in short the muse of the creative fancy is a jealous mistress prone to sulk and deny the light of her countenance to a suitor who thinks to share his addresses with another but this illuminating discovery did little to allay his discontent progress with his work alone could accomplish that and the work dragged dolefully he scored only dismal failures in his efforts to produce something to satisfy himself and he had only six months to prove his worth the date of their marriage had been fixed for february every detail of their plans had been worked out under the masterful guidance of helena even the steamer upon which they were to sail for egypt had been selected and their suite reserved in short he positively had to win out within the allotted period of grace who seemed able only to sit there day in and out beside his typewriter with idle hands or with a vacant mind to pace his trail of torment from door to window getting nowhere stripped of every vestige of his arduously acquired craftsmanship it was maddening none the less doggedly savagely determined to overcome this sentimental handicap he worked long hours only to review the outcome of his labours with a sinking heart for all his knowledge of the stage for all that a long career of failures and half-hearted successes had taught him the play that slowly took shape under his modelling lacked vitality the living fire of drama technically he could find no disastrous fault with it but in his soul he knew it to be as passionless as a proposition in euclid he was a dreamer but not even the stuff of dreams could dull the clear perceptions of his critical intelligence meantime the superficial routine of workaday life went on much as it had ever since he had set up shop in the establishment of madame de prat his breakfasts were served him in his rooms for his other meals he foraged in neighboring restaurants 
a definite amount of exercise was required to keep him in working trim in short he was in and out of the house several times each day inevitably then he encountered fellow lodgers either on the stoop or in the hallway among them and perhaps more often and less adventitiously than in other instances one wistful young woman shabbily dressed in whose brown eyes lurked a hesitant appeal for recognition he grew acquainted with the sight of her but he was generally in haste and preoccupied looked over her head if not through her stepped civilly out of her way and went absently his own and never once dreamed of identifying her with that dreary and damp creature of the rain-swept night whose necessity had turned him out of his lodgings for a single night one day the second thursday following his return to town he found himself waiting in the lobby of the knickerbocker a trifle early for a luncheon engagement with rideout and his producing manager will brown a meeting arranged for the purpose of discussing the forthcoming production of the jade god the day was seasonably insufferable with heat but there was here a grateful drift of air through open doors and windows lounging in an armchair he lazily consumed a cigarette and reviewed the listless ebb and flow of guests with a desultory interest which was presently suddenly and rudely quickened marbridge accompanied by a woman was leaving the eastern dining-room they passed so near to matthias that by stretching forth his foot he could have touched the woman's skirt but she did not see him her face was averted as she looked up faintly smiling to the face of her companion marbridge on his part was attending her with that slightly exaggerated attitude of solicitude and devotion which was peculiarly his with all women if he saw matthias he made no sign his dark and boyish eyes ogled his companion his tone was pitched low to a key of intimacy he rolled a trifle in his walk with the insuppressible swagger of the amateur of gallantry they passed on and out of the hotel and matthias saw the carriage porter at a sign from marbridge whistle in a taxicab he turned away in disgust a moment or so later he looked up to find marbridge standing over him and grinning impudently as he offered a hand why how do you do matthias my boy his voice by no means subdued echoed through the lobby and attracted curious glances matthias ignoring the hand lifted one of his own in a gesture deprecatory softly he begged somebody might hear you unabashed marbridge dropped into the chair beside him how's that why shouldn't they they might make the mistake of inferring that i liked you returned matthias marbridge on the point of settling back sat up with a start the dull collar flushed his plump dark cheeks for an instant his hands twitched nervously and his full lips tightened on a retort which he presumably deemed inadvisable for mastering his impulse he sank back again and put a period to the display with a brief but not uneasy chuckle <laughs> you are all there with the acidulated repartee he observed appreciatively some class to your work my boy to which matthias making no comment he added with at least some effort toward an appearance of sincerity sorry you feel that way about me unfortunately i do because i wouldn't act on your suggestion about that time-table eh because of the circumstances which moved me to drop that hint a brief silence prefaced marbridge's next remark but damn it i couldn't it would have made talk if i pulled out when you wanted me to there would have been no occasion for any talk whatever if you'd known how to comport yourself as the guest of decent people and still marbridge husbanded his resentment oh well he said agreed women matthias threw away his cigarette and prepared to rise hold on a bit marbridge checked him i want to ask a favor of you of course you're right i am a bad actor and all that i'm sorry i forgot myself at tanglewood word of honor i am well matthias suggested with an unmoved face look here marbridge sat up eagerly i think you're a mighty good sort thanks 
you didn't blow about that business down there i couldn't very well could i with a woman involved oh you did the right thing i'm not disputing that but what i'm worried about now is whether you're as good a sport as you seem meaning marbridge nodded significantly toward the sidewalk where he had put his late companion into the cab about today you won't find it necessary to by god matthias's indignation brimmed over if you're so solicitous of the woman's good name why the devil do you allow her to be seen in your company it isn't that marbridge persisted keeping himself well in hand after all what's a lunch at the nick well the trouble is she's supposed to be at newport magenda doesn't know you just can't help being a blackguard can you marbridge matthias inquired curiously you ought to have bitten off your tongue before you named a name in a public place like this he rose meeting with steady eyes the vicious glare of the other one word more if i hear of your accepting another invitation to tanglewood i'll forget to be what you call a good sport marbridge jumped up hotly look here he said in accents that though guarded trembled i've been mighty patient with your insolence and i'm certainly not going to forget myself here but if you want to make a book on it i'll lay you any odds you like that i'll be received at tanglewood within the year and you won't say one single damn word do you make me matthias looked him up and down smiled quietly swung on his heel and moved across the lobby to greet rideout and wilbrow his instinctive inclination to dismiss altogether from his mind a subject so distasteful was helped out by a conference which outlasted luncheon involved dinner with the two men of the theatre and was only concluded in matthias's rooms shortly after midnight wilbrow considering the play from the point of view of him upon whom devolved all responsibility for the manner of its presentation the scene painting alone excepted and gifted with that intuitive sense du theatre singular to men of his vocation who very nearly monopolized the intelligence concerned with the american stage to-day wilbrow had uncovered a slight by no means damning flaw in the construction of the third act and had a remedy to suggest this adopted without opposition from the playwright suggested further alterations which matthias could not deny were calculated to strengthen the piece in consequence when at length they left him he found himself committed to a virtual rewriting of the last two acts entire groaning in resignation he resolved to accomplish the revision in one week of solid uninterrupted labor and went to bed rising the next morning to deny himself his correspondence and the newspapers and to make arrangements with madame de Prat to furnish all his meals until his task was finished these matters settled and his telephone temporarily silenced he began to work and forgetful of the world plodded faithfully on by day and night until late thursday afternoon when he drew the final page from his typewriter thrust it with its forerunners into an envelope addressed to rideout entrusted this last to a messenger and threw himself upon the couch to drop off instantly into profound slumbers of exhaustion at ten o'clock that night he was awakened and sat up dazed and blinking in a sudden glare of gaslight stupidly bemused with the slowly settling dust of dreams he stared incredulous of the company in which he found himself madame de Prat, having shown his callers in and made a light for them was discreetly departing george tankerville whose vigorous methods had roused matthias stood over him with a look of deep and sympathetic anxiety clouding his round commonplace friendly countenance wearing a dinner jacket together with linen motor cap and duster oil-stained gauntlets on his hands with an implacable impatience betrayed in his very pose he cut a figure sufficiently striking instantly to engage attention the unexpectedness of his call aside furthermore he was accompanied by his wife helena in a costume as unconventional as her husband's stood at a little distance regarding matthias with 
much the same look of consternation and care great scott matthias exclaimed pulling his wits together you are a sudden pair of people with a shrug and a sour smile he deprecated his clothing which consisted solely of a shirt linen trousers and a pair of antiquated slippers if you'd only given me some warning i'd have tried to dress up to your elegance he went on damn your clothes tankerville exploded he dropped a hand on matthias's shoulder and swung him round to the light tell us you're all right that's all we want to know all right matthias looked from one to the other deeply perplexed why of course i'm all right why not with a little gasp of relief helena dropped into a chair tankerville removed his hand and leaned against the table smiling foolishly that's all right then he said we tried to get you on the telephone all afternoon failed we're afraid you've done something foolish and took a run into town to make sure what the dickens are you driving at matthias demanded i had my telephone cut off the other day because i was working and didn't want to be interrupted i do that frequently why not what's got into you two anyway have you gone dotty no helena replied with a grim pale smile we are sane enough and thank heaven you are but venetia venetia matthias cried what about venetia tankerville avoiding his eye it devolved upon helena to respond to matthias's frantic and imperative look venetia she said reluctantly venetia eloped with marbridge day before yesterday tuesday she came into town in the morning to do some shopping met him and was married to him at the city hall they sailed on the mauritania yesterday the papers didn't get hold of it we we knew nothing till this afternoon i was afraid she might have written you and you in despair her voice broke after a little matthias turned to a heap of unopened correspondence on a side table and ran rapidly through it examining only the addresses no he said presently in a level tone no she didn't trouble to write End of chapter 10